After about two hours the court retired, and I was left with a strong guard to keep away the crowd, some of whom had had the impudence to shoot their arrows at me as I sat by the door of my house. But the colonel ordered six of them to be seized and delivered bound into my hands. I put five of them into my coat pocket, and as to the sixth, I made a face as if I would eat him alive. The poor man screamed terribly, and the colonel and his officers were much distressed, especially when they saw me take out my penknife. But I soon set them at ease, for cutting the strings he was bound with, I put him gently on the ground, and away he ran. I treated the rest in the same manner, taking them one by one out of my pocket, and I saw that both the soldiers and people were delighted at this mark of my kindness. Toward night I got with some difficulty into my house, where I lay on the ground, as I had to do for a fortnight, till a bed was prepared for me out of six hundred beds of the ordinary measure. Six hundred servants were appointed me, and three hundred tailors made me a suit of clothes. Moreover, six of His Majesty's greatest scholars were employed to teach me their language, so that soon I was able to converse after a fashion with the Emperor, who often honoured me with his visits. The first words I learned were to desire that he would please to give me my liberty, which I every day repeated on my knees. But he answered that this must be a work of time, and that first I must swear a peace with him and his kingdom. He told me also that by the laws of the nation I must be searched by two of his officers, and that, as this could not be done without my help, he trusted them in my hands, and whatever they took from me should be returned when I left the country. I took up the two officers and put them into my coat pockets. These gentlemen, having pen, ink, and paper about them, made an exact list of everything they saw, which I afterward translated into English, and which ran as follows. In the right coat pocket of the great man mountain, we found only one great piece of coarse cloth, large enough to cover the carpet of your majesty's chief room of state in the left pocket we saw a huge silver chest with a silver cover which we could not lift we desired that it should be opened and one of us stepping into it found himself up to the mid leg in a sort of dust some of which flying into our faces sent us both into a fit of sneezing in his right waistcoat pocket we found a number of white thin substances folded one over another about the size of three men, tied with a strong cable and marked with black figures, which we humbly conceived to be writings. In the left there was a sort of engine, from the back of which extended twenty long poles, with which, we conjecture, the man-mountain combs his head. In the smaller pocket on the right side were several round flat pieces of white and red metal of different sizes. Some of the white, which appeared to be silver, were so large and heavy that my comrade and I could hardly lift them. From another pocket hung a huge silver chain, with a wonderful kind of engine fastened to it, a globe half silver and half of some transparent metal, for on the transparent side we saw certain strange figures, and thought we could touch them till we found our fingers stopped by the shining substance. This engine made an incessant noise, like a water-mill, and we conjecture it is either some unknown animal or the god he worships, but probably the latter, as he told us that he seldom did anything without consulting it. This is a list of what we found about the body of the man-mountain who treated us with great civility. I had one private pocket which escaped their search, containing a pair of spectacles and a small spy-glass, which, being of no consequence to the emperor, I did not think myself bound in honour to discover. 